This is Tanya Pearson interviewing Melissa Oftermauer on November 21st, 2018 in Hudson, New York for the Women of Rock Oral History Project. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So nice to finally meet you. Um, like I said, off camera, we start at the beginning and uh, yep. it's kind of like a this is your life. Um, yes, I just did an, a, a this is your life for Courtney two weeks ago, <laughs> so I'm familiar with it. <laughs> um, where did you grow up? Montreal, Canada, Quebec, Canada. Um, four hours north of where we're sitting right now. And what did your parents do? Oh, epic, independent, uh, freewheeling, choose your own adventure types, both freelancers for their whole lives. Um, both uh, started as journalists, um, writer journalists. So they both had a, a first wave of uh, newspapers. They both founded two different independent presses my mother a French one, my father an English one. They were both radical politically, very much of their time. My mother, 100% first wave feminist, decided to do everything that every woman she had never seen do. Uh, and then my father was a um, child of very, very um, poor immigrants and really built an incredible uh, world for himself. So she ended up in <clears throat> the grand world of Quebec theater, but via CBC and her own radio shows and broadcasting. So she went journalism into Quebec theater and she became the leading literary translator. And she is to this day multi pins from Canadian government of um, her passion is to bring the French Canadian theater voice to the rest of the world. So that's what she does. Um, Linda Gaborio and Nick Oftermauer, who died 20 years ago this year, he took his journalism into radio, into a remarkable television show that he had from 69 through 72, which was really early wave, man on the street, camera on film, interviewing everyone from, you know, and in that time, late uh, 60s, early 70s, captured like a remarkable oral history of um, the people on the streets of Montreal at that time. And it was a huge uh, political upheaval at that time in Montreal, like there was here, but the equivalent of the race, race kinds of riots here was a language war there between the French and the English, and both my parents fought for the underdog, for the French, and my father ended up becoming a politician and running um, on and off uh, downtown Montreal for 20 years. So he has a street named after him, had the biggest, history in Mon uh, biggest funeral in Montreal history, which both, um, actually Patty was not there, Courtney came to the funeral, Courtney and Eric came to the funeral. But it was a big turning point in my life, and my father was larger than life in many, many, many regards. And really, uh, he was married to the city of Montreal. My parents were not together for pretty much any of my life. But uh, he was a remarkable man of the people who was driven entirely to serve the people and make sure that political jerks and financial hungry assholes don't uh, abuse people. He was a humanist and he was remarkable and he uh, is very dearly remembered in Montreal. Could use him here. Yeah, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling my father grow in me more and more every day. I've been in Hudson for 10 years now and so many of my friends say like, oh, this is when your father came out of me. It's just, it's changed. He, uh, yeah, this, especially in the last two years in this country, I feel a lot of him, although it's a much more brutal system than Montreal, Quebec, Canada is. So I don't know how far I can go, but I can do good in a small town called Hudson. Or, I mean, Melissa off from our 2020. We would yeah. <laughs> um, did you have any siblings? Um, I'm an only child for my two parents, and I have a half-brother. My mother remarried when I was 10. They didn't get married, but my mother um, had started a, an amazing life with a French man. And so I got a half-brother, Eve, who is 10 years younger than me, and I got two older French stepbrothers. So there's a remarkable world of Eve, Sébastien, Guillaume, Bordeaux de Fontenay, a ton of French guys in my life, and I was the only girl. and English speaking. I spoke French, but it was a very, I was very lone wolf in my later, the blended family. <laughs> you said you were a tomboy. Is that 
yep. or brothers or <laughs> I well I kind of would have rather have been invisible to them but I uh, I think I just liked to, I was very shy and I liked to be invisible to as many people as possible <laughs> so I was very lucky to go to a very freaky art school my entire life so the best thing my mother did was commit to never changing my schooling so I went from grade one through high school to a remarkable school a uh, public school devoted to music and art over anything else so the joke was I barely took like academics till I was like in middle school I mean it was like a remark and it started in one room of the YWCA and expanded to be one of the biggest public schools in downtown Montreal but it was called face fine arts core education and then for the super weirdos like me you could go to a side wing called mind moving in new directions for the last three years and that's what i did and my school single-handedly defined who i am as far as the upbringing part um and uh everyone you know there was no sports or cheerleaders everyone was just weird like kids of freaky hippies and everyone's parents mostly were freelancers so we were all you know there was no like none of that stuff that it seemed like alien in movies of like popular people or unpopular it was just everybody was cool and weird and I'm very fortunate and I always felt very safe to be me not pressured to like have breasts or be a girl or I just sort of was, and my mother was just the most independent woman I've ever, I mean, she was a single mother until um, I was 10. My father kind of came in and out briefly. Um, but uh, I just never defined myself like as a, even in, it, when I started a band, I was very like not into like, we're starting a girl band. I was actually quite turned off by that. I was like, I'm a musician and I'm a human. <laughs> I'm not a woman or a girl. I just like music. and. At the time, probably because I was a daughter of a super radically ahead of her time woman who re rebelled from like suburban Massachusetts, Boston, very, very uh, traditional family. And she just went running as fast as she could and got as weird as she could as fast as she could. So I just, I really uh, didn't grow up with like kind of a normal woman as a role model so there's and and her whole thing was like you can do whatever you want and i did whatever i want and i and you know her thing when we were we traveled i celebrated my second birthday in africa i because she was traveling alone as a single mother because quote unquote motherhood would not stop her from climbing kilimanjaro so that was the type of woman i was raised by and then i just always felt very comfortable as um, and not no pressure to become like a woman I don't know how to explain it other than that is like you know I never I mean she definitely complained about my always military khaki like basically I now dress like I <laughs> used to but I just like didn't really care about what I wore I liked depressing new wave British music and I there wasn't really any like women role models that like dressed up. I mean, yeah, I like Debbie Harry and obviously like Madonna was exciting and Cindy Lauper because she was seemed like a redhead, but I wasn't into girly stuff. I was very much into, uh, I guess, just a world of my own that didn't sort of define much. Um, you know, I dated a couple mods. So like we were kind of like just in like very straight clothes. No, I don't know, no curves. I don't know. I was very late bloomer too. So. I think I just like really embraced that people thought I was a boy for many years. <laughs> I also wish that I knew that you were a late bloomer when I oh. was growing up. It would have made me feel Oh so my much God, so late. I mean, when I basically <laughs> turned into a sort of woman a year into joining Hole. So by 23, I was like, oh, maybe I, I had never worn lipstick. I had never, I mean, I, my very good friend still with the first makeup artist was like, have you ever put makeup on? Have you ever tweezed your eyebrows? I'm like, no. I like had photo shoots all of a sudden I had to do, and I just like let people do things but yeah I was not um, into that kind of grooming or and I you know still have very small breasts and I never had big breasts so I just never felt very like uh, yeah focused on that yeah, yeah. Um, what kind of did you were academics like important to you or your family? School, yeah, my parents, um, incredibly, because there was some religion in both uh, of their upbringing that turned them off, they were atheist, political, intellectual, 
unbelievably well-read literary people. So in many ways, I rebelled against that. I mean, they were so smart, like just so well-read history and everything. Um, so I really went visuals and sound. So because of this amazing school, I went to photography from the age of 13, very committed to music. I went to a music school that was like dominated my life. So I wasn't excited about books and history and I still am not a big reader I hate to say I'm a big talker organizer lover of life but music and visuals is the way for me I definitely love school though I love the structure and I did go to um, college you know I left in my last year of Concordia University with my master's in photography when I joined Hull and I was very reluctant to leave I didn't want to leave school because I was actually planning to do my master's but all in photography and I'm still dreaming of doing my master's so I'm I probably will um, go back to school because I love the structure of learning and the dialogue and I also really you know would be open to speaking in schools and talking about yeah I really I really like school I just don't like a lot of high intellectual I, I mean I definitely think a lot but I, I I would be more in the area of sort of mystic emotional analysis than a bunch of intellectual destroying of ideas stuff yeah surviving grad school no I'm right because I'm like Patty already emailed the can get you speaking gigs at the five oh colleges. okay yeah, yeah I'm would love to I've done you. lots and lots of talking speaking stuff like little kids big kids yeah yeah I like it um so you said you started playing music at the Mm -hmm. high school what was your first musical instrument uh well like every first you know early early years you you learn the basics on recorder and xylophone and then you choose your instrument and trumpet was my instrument i was the only girl and i was the first trumpet so i was the the most focused and um committed trumpet player in my band and then when I went to join Mind, I had the option to sort of do extracurricular instead of being in the high, in the band. So that was all the way until high school. And then in high school, I uh, went to 100% photography. So I just, I had my own dark room and I did all the, our, our high school um, yearbook was basically just a punk rock fanzine. And I took every picture of every student and I did all the collages. So I was like the photographer girl and had my own sweet dark room. Uh, so it wasn't until I started playing the bass um, after high school that I found my second instrument, which was the bass. Yeah. And um, just, well, I guess right before we get to college, what were your kind of expectations for yourself as a young person? And what were your kind of expectations when you were going to What's really great is... Um, inspired by this long deep conversation I had yesterday they mentioned uh, the person mentioned like wow you kind of just started this place we were speaking specifically about this place Basilica which in many ways is kind of like my new band in terms of my project that I'm committed to and and I don't go into things with expectations and I don't go into things with any plans I go into things with my heart and gut saying I should do it and uh, I'm not a big person that strives for security and financial blah, blah. I just take, I mean, I, I, I suppose I take a lot of risks is what it is. And I don't like necessarily like championing myself as like a fearless motherfucker. I just really don't. I've been, I moved out when I was 16. I was very independent my whole life and I, I don't really worry about um, security. I don't know how else to describe it. But then, I mean, I just wanted to be in the moment. What I love about music is you're in the moment. You're not really, it was never, ever an aspiration. That's why joining Hole was so hard for me. I did not want to be a, I hate the word rock star. I've never used it. Only now, 20 years out of like, the major LA version of that game, can I even use the word? I hate it. I never aspired to that. My heroes were, you know, the closest thing was like a Glenn Danzig. So yes, Danzig was, I guess, what you call like a hero rock star, but he was really nerdy and weird comic book guy. You know, Morrissey, Robert Smith, all the kind of people who like I grew up adoring didn't have that superhero larger than life kind of, they just seemed like really 
odd people who were trying really. So I didn't romanticize the notion of becoming a successful musician. I romanticized the notion of me finding my people and me finding my voice. That's all I cared about. We could have played this shitty, dirty room for my entire career and I would have been fine. And in fact, I do sometimes play this shitty, dirty room in my weird avant-garde music festivals at Basilica because I, I, I failed to mention that in that upbringing part with my father who ran downtown Montreal, I grew up in the public eye in, in Montreal. I was the daughter, the only daughter of a very, uh, very special, magical, but slightly controversial. He was a, it was a, a bachelor, man about town. They call him a bon, bon vivant, boulevardier. He, he died very young from too much smoking, too much drinking. He was like a 1950s, like fedora wearing silent film star. The guy was remarkable, but I grew up in his shadow and I grew up a very uh, well-known girl that did not, uh, that made me more shy, I believe. I think that had a lot to do with my upbringing being why it was so hard for me to speak in public and things. And even in class, even though I was comfortable in my school, I didn't like. Um, then so something about that, I already kind of had issues a little bit. My mother did not like me growing up in the public eye. And there was like, I remember a lot of sort of debates and like worst case scenario, my mother accusing my father of exploiting me to make him look good kind of thing. So I had a pretty like complex version of what outside adoration is. And my father, who was a remarkable person, but a very uh, difficult, tortured person, uh, he was one of those people who needed to be adored to have a big life on the outside, but live alone at home and not really have a very deep, intimate life. So I was the only person that was sort of a responsibility to have an intimate relationship with because he was never married again after the six months with my mother and his family were really intense, um, religious, um, uh, remarkable themselves, spirited beyond belief, but not like normal people at all. So his relationship with them was really fraught. And so I was the only one who had a private life with my father who lived a full public life. And that really uh, has defined a big part of me. And it's not um, something that I'm, it's very connected to why I was also a good fit for Courtney and later for Billy is that in many ways, Courtney and Billy were like these weird second versions of my parents. Weirdly, Courtney is more like my father, uh, and they did actually have a very special connection, the two of them. They had a real deep understanding because my father was a real, real shit disturber, real radical and outspoken person, not afraid to tell everybody how he, and he was ahead of the curve like she was. He just spoke out politically, but his causes were different. But he was, so I think that's why I never, it's like the last thing I wanted was like, um, like any kind of like successful fame element to my life. But at the same time, I worshiped music so much that I desperately wanted to get out there because I wanted to find my own voice and be my own person. So that drive was really like kind of uh, intense as far as um, like a, a conflict of like, and it wasn't the same as like the 90s, like anti-success conflict, which a lot, had a, there was a lot of that of like, I don't want to succeed. It sucks being, you know, whatever. There was some, like, there's a bunch of cynical, strange, or the th sellout thing, which we shouldn't have, like, I hate corporations. For me to join a band, an American corporation, was dreadful for me at that time. I grew up with everything that is the opposite of that. My parents never worked for one corporation in their entire lives. It was really a, a something, a hard pill for me to swallow. It was really, I did it for the individuals and for the women in music. I compromised a lot of my own beliefs to be in a band on major labels and my whole journey in music um, continued to be conflicted like that. And so as so did the part of me that kind of just wants to be a photographer and be alone in a dark room and have my community but not have to necessarily deal with all these strange people that have a bigger relationship to the outside world than they do to their inner world. And that was like a real, and I've been working on that a lot as I become older and as a mother. And so complex stuff about the relationship with the public life and all that.
You're a great interviewee. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Crossing stuff t- off okay. as you go along. Okay. <clears throat> um, I mean, you talked a, a little bit about college. You went for photography. Yeah. Um, and then we're going for a master's in photography. But before that, you said that you also picked up the base, the yeah. Right? How uh, and that was really a side project. My, I mean, my love of music was so deep, so, so and real. I mean, luck and because I had played music my whole life, I had like a an ear and an understanding for music. And I don't mean on an academic. I mean, I did have an academic knowledge of it, but it was more that I was very fearless when joining like a band of like way older guys. Actually, a big pivotal moment for me as a bass player. Um, when I was about 18, 19, uh, that's worth mentioning in this context is um, I had been playing a, a alone in a room a bunch, but I had seen a bunch of shows. So I started, I was, I started working in bars way too young. So like 15 years old, 16 years old, I was like a ticket girl at the big punk rock club where everyone, I saw Nirvana, Sonic Youth, I say every single band that ever played any club, the Melvins, Helmet, every, eh. I was the ticket girl and I was way underage, even though 18 was the drinking age in Quebec and still is at the time. But I, um, uh, I, I saw all the bands. I w- worked in the nightlife. I became a DJ at the, the club that all the bands go to after they play a show, so a little dive bar. I became the first woman DJ there um, at 17. Uh, my mother, side note, was the first female rock disc jockey on the Montreal Airwaves, so I had already had quite a good um, uh, role model, of, or just not even role, I didn't see it as that, it was just like, yeah, I can do it, oh, there's, I didn't even think there's no other girl DJ here, but I was friends with a guy, we liked the same music, and he's like, oh, you want to cover one of my shifts, and it just turned in to that, and so all these older guys that liked the same music of me than I did kind of took me under their wing both at the club as the ticket girl at the and meanwhile I'm totally like gender neutral not not I'm not making out with any of them I'm totally like pretty much um I was uh what's it called I forgot what Morrissey is that I was for years celibate I was not interested in guys and like so I was just like into music and I'd spent all this time in the like like many many too many nights a week too young for too long through my 20s and 30s actually just like out all the time music 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 and i had this like really amazing turning point um so imagine i'm seeing all these shows and in that time whole opening up for buffalo tom in front of 15 people uh uh right before pretty on the inside uh, uh came out um then there was uh, Sonic Youth, kind of at the height of like 1991, year punk broke kind of era. Um, and pr- pretty much, I, I, I guess I saw The Breeders, I saw L7. There was like a bunch of women that I got exposed to in that they gave me good notion of like, oh, I obviously can do that too. So I was very lucky that I actually got to see them play. And because I you know, there's before the internet and such, but like I saw them in the flesh and I just somehow knew the bass was the right one. I do have a memory of Jill Emery making an impression on me when I watched Hole. Obviously, Courtney is, and I couldn't be more different in personality, so she wasn't one I related to, but Jill I really kind of connected with. And Jill and I, I don't, I think maybe I only met her once in all of my, yeah, I think she and I maybe met once, but, um, there was something with the bass that seemed really obvious that that was going to be my first instrument and i think someone lent me one my father bought me my first one when i was 17 i started playing it and i had this like momentous moment happen where a bunch of girls who also hung out at the club um at the like dive bar that i played at but also went to the shows they were a little older than me uh, one of the, my friends, Cecil Catstalucci, she had a cute band called Nerdy Girl later in LA, but she and I are dear friends. Um, she's my daughter's godmother. And she told me that her and the other girls that I kind of knew from the bar were going to start a band, a girl band. I said, oh, great. You know, I'm, I play bass. And, and so I showed up at this like little jam space that they were getting together at. And the girls weren't very nice to me. And it was like this sort of weird. And one of the girls said, well, I'm learning how to play bass. And I said, and Cecil said, oh, she plays trumpet, too. I was like, I, I, and I said, I love bass. There could be two basses. Anyway, I left this, like, weird, uptight rehearsal, 
and where they were literally, my impression was they were preparing their band name and their logo before they even knew how to play an instrument. And I left there and they were not very friendly with me. My friend Cecil called me after I left and she's like, I'm so sorry, I have no idea why those girls were like that. I guess Denise really wants to be the bass player. And I said, that's fine. I don't actually want to join that band anyway because I actually want to learn my instrument. Uh, and that was this weird moment in my life where when I had that understanding of like, I don't want to join a girl band. I actually really want to learn how to play music. And what ended up happening is all the guys that DJed at the bar were all those girls' boyfriends and they all played in the actual huge established indie rock punk rock bands in Montreal and I ended up starting a band with them and I just like went down to their practice space after like one night at the at the bar and I said oh, can I try this amp and it was one of the huge amps I had never had like played through an SVT and they're like oh do you want to start a side project with us and then the irony and weirdness was that like these girls would then come to like pick up their boyfriends at band practice but I was in the band and I always thought like you girls really missed the point because like you're you could learn. I just wanted to play with a great drummer. I didn't want to be in a band. I just wanted to play music. That was the real thing. And that was a turning point for me. And I got really good really quick for a year playing with these guys. And we weren't really doing it to play shows. We were just playing in a rehearsal space to write songs. I learned a bunch from them. Really great drummer, great guitar player. And they were all seminal guys in the 80s and 90s in Montreal rock bands. And I just was very lucky to be able to just, A, not, I don't know how I wasn't shy to be deciding that I should just play with these older guys, but I learned fast. And then same happened when I joined, started my little band. We like, I found these other guys um, that were kind of more my age and we started my first band, Tinker. Uh, and then the joke is, is that I, our eighth show ever was opening up for Smashing Pumpkins during the Siamese Dream Tour because I wrote a letter to the P.O. box, the fan box, saying, Hi, Billy, remember me? I met you in 1991 when my roommate threw a beer bottle at you. I finally started a band. Can I open up for you? And miraculously, somehow, Virgin Records, don't ask me how he got the letter and I opened up for him. That, but that's, again, like how I had even the notion, but I asked... He somehow got it. My band, Tinker, opened up for um, them and Swerve Driver, which was another one of my favorite bands, in front of 3,000 people. I had only played like tiny clubs with like 40 people before that. And I walked off stage and Billy Corgan, who, Smashing Pumpkins were by far my, my life-changing music band because of the sonics. I just loved oceans of sound. I wanted layers and layers of guitars and rolling drums and bass and like that is what captured my heart and that's what I always wanted to be able to play and that's kind of what my band was you know aspiring to be and I walked off the stage and Billy Corgan uh, who de and he and I are both born on St. Patrick's Day and we had discovered that when I met him like when I was a teenager when I first saw him play in front of like 15 people at uh, at the same punk rock club that I was the ticket girl at and he had remembered me and that's how it all happened but he I w walked off the stage and he said Melissa you're better than my bass player you're gonna be in my band one day and I just first of all, I thought a Darcy is pretty good and B wow even if I never see you again I just got the biggest <laughs> vote of confidence from one of my heroes and it really um it gave me probably similar to like the choir teacher that I devoted my first soul and donate and donated. <laughs> I'm running a nonprofit now, so you'll see where my head is. But I, um, I uh, dedicated my first solo record to Mr. Ewan Edwards, my Welsh choir teacher, because he could see that in the shy girl, there was a girl who so badly wanted to sing, but I was so shy. My friend Rufus Wainwright was the loud guy next to me. I was always in the shadow of everybody that was doing so great in music. And he just like, worked with me over my youth just trying to get me and the the turning point i had with him was he would always try to get me to audition for the solos i'd be like no i do not want to do a solo i want to sing with the choir i'm not gonna say and he'd make me like go private sing this and he'd say melissa you're so good you just need a little more confidence and that guy and billy corgan sealed the deal for me as far as like if they believe in me I think I can do this. And it was just like this, and I don't even know what I wanted to do other than make amazing music and just like learn 
what songs are and what drummers and drum and bass players do together. And I just continued on my journey like that. And then like three months later, Billy told Courtney and Kristen had died and they were on like a nationwide search, even in like England. So like an international search for bass player replacement. And, um, and Courtney and you now the whole band was living in this horrendous wake of loss from Kurt and then Kristen and I got a phone call. This is all rotary phones and postcards. All my whole life changed from real like analog communication like that. But I came home from uh, college one university one day and um, Billy Corgan called, said, hey, I got good news and great news. I'm playing at Lollapalooza. We're going to be in Montreal next month. You should come, uh, come to the show. I have a day off. We can have lunch. Great. The great news is you're going to join my friend Courtney Love's band Hole. And I said, no, I'm not. No, I have my own band here and I'm actually preparing to apply for my master's next year and I'm really busy. Uh, and also that band seems really painful. I thank you very much for the recommendation, but that's uh, no, thank you. He ended up, you know, a month later he came, we like had, maybe it was like a week later, but it all happened very quickly where he came to town, we had lunch, we like walked through this park that in front of my mother's house and he said, like, why don't you want to be in one of the biggest, he literally said, and this is 1994, it was June of 1994, why don't you want to play in the biggest female rock band ever and pretty much never have to work? And I said, that doesn't sound fun to me. Uh, no, thank you. And he was like, okay. And he left it. And then a week or so later, um, came in, my roommate said, Courtney Love called for you. I said, really? Did she leave a number? I didn't call her back. Then the next day, there was a message on my machine. And then by the next day, I, I don't think I called her back. I think she, she called me again. And it was late night. And it was in my my... I remember clearly my bedroom decor, lots of gold and velvet. And, and she said, uh, and she's like, hi, why don't you want to join my band? I said, I have a lot going on, actually. I'm, I, <laughs> I'm in school and I have a band. And she said, can you just get on the plane to Seattle this weekend and tell, that, tell me to my face, just come meet us. And she was super convincing and it was a really good point. Like perhaps I should not just say no when I don't know, you know, although I obviously had a pretty strong, strong gut reaction, which was, that seemed like a very heavy, um, but also kind of similar to what I described earlier of like, I didn't want to be a famous musician. I also didn't want to necessarily be making a statement for women in rock music. But I flew across the country, I listened on my cassette, and I, the at Live Through This was just coming out, and I was a DJ, so I always got advanced copies from my promoter friends, and I had listened to it a bit, but I hadn't, wasn't really familiar with it yet, and I listened to it all the way to Seattle, and I had just like an overnight little bag in my bass, and I listened to the Walkman over and over, and I thought, oh, these are pretty easy songs, okay, and um, and because I'm less of an academic and certainly never articulated feminism, I'm now realizing, especially after revisiting whole music now, 20 years later, I didn't realize the power of her lyrics at the time. I have never been a singer songwriter fan. So I am like, you know, like Courtney loves Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen. I love Black Sabbath and Caius and I just like witchy poo. I like, <laughs> like ghosts and magic and I have seen them and I believe in it. So it was all very academic in some way for me. And I, um, so the joke is I probably missed a, a lot of the point during my time in Hole. I now know that actually, which is why I just uh, honored her at our big Basilica Hudson Pioneering People uh, event two weeks ago is I just re-listened to all three Hole albums and 20 years later, I am a very changed person. The world couldn't be more different. And I, I'm not ashamed to say, but Courtney was ahead of her time and I was not there yet either in my understanding of what had to happen for women until 
on a gut level, I got off the plane in Seattle and I came down on the um, uh, escalator and at the bottom of the escalator was Courtney, Francis, Patty, and um, a very lovely babysitter holding Francis. And I came down on the escalator, looked at these women. They were all smiling so like, hi. And I, before I'd even like said hello, I saw them and my gut, I just went, oh fuck, I have to do this. I do. These are the women. They, I hate to say, but I felt that they need me. It was like, and so it's not like I'm a martyr. I did it for them, but I really just like saw these women and just saw the hole that they were literally trying to fill and I couldn't say no. And I realized just, I just had to do it. And I didn't, it was scary though, because I really, my A, my life would have been radically different if I didn't. And I am very um, grateful for the once in a lifetime opportunity, but it was a hard decision for me. And I really did do it for those individuals but also for what those individuals were doing, a lesbian, a widow, a feminist, a deceased woman, Kristen. It's like, I have to do it for the women of the future. I just have to do this with them. Okay, I'm glad they picked me. I'm glad that they knew, but they knew before I did. That's what's weird about it is that I did not long to be in that band. I did not try to be in that band. They chose me, and then later, of course, we figure out it's like because I said no. And that was this whole strange part of it is that Courtney, for some reason, when Billy Corgan told her that I wasn't interested, she's like, that's it. That's the girl. <laughs> I want her. And um, that is weird, but it is true. And then um, when they brought me right away to Kurt and Courtney's house, put me in this like beautiful guest room and... Um, Patty came in and said, you know, so warm and so lovely and hi, I'm so glad you could come. You're Canadian. I love Canadian TV. I'm like, yeah, I, you know, Canadian comedy is really good. Yeah. Oh, you're redhead. Yeah, no, me too. And we had this like really sweet little talk in the bedroom. And then she said, you know, I just want you to know that Courtney hasn't met one other bass player that we've auditioned. Me and Eric have been auditioning these girls and she hasn't even come to a practice, let alone pick you up at the airport and bring you to her house. I think she, she, she really wants you to do this. And as like, and that's as I kind of like opened and saw, I mean, I, it all seems like a very strange uh, fairy tale to me now, as far as kind of like how out of this world it was. Cause it wasn't, it was like out of my control. Out of, how did they know? Why, how could she have been so sure? I have no clue. I mean, yes, I came with a good recommendation. Billy Corgan is a real musician, so he had a musician recommendation. He had an instinct that I was the right person. Anyway, so that day forever changed my life, and I would not be who I am here right now, and I would not, you know, my school, and then my triple masters in whole, triple masters in humanity, um, and then my radical last year with the Smashing Pumpkins, which was my absolute PhD in musicianship. So I'm the luckiest girl on the planet as far as my dream to find my people and make music and learn from some of the greatest musicians of my time, both in a lyrical kind of corny way, which was kind of way beyond me that I didn't even understand at the time. And then Billy and James and, and Jimmy in the pumpkins, as far as my intensive um, music crash course with them. I, you know, I don't want to ever like live with the feeling of guilt, but the amount of privilege I feel of what I was given in my musical, with like truly given, I didn't even really try. <laughs> I'm the lucky, I am so grateful for my strange music parents that came and took me under their wings and defined who I am, you know, so I spent my 20s in those two bands and then I, um, then I became 30 after 9-11-ish. It was like 9-11, I, I left, I left both bands, I will say that. I did, and neither Billy nor Courtney were necessarily ready or wanting me to leave. I left for very educated you know, reasons where I believe that they didn't, I, it was, I really needed to get back to myself and I went and made two solo records and then here I am now. But Can I go back a little bit? Yeah. Um, you sort of answered this um, bef 
before, so I don't want to make you repeat yourself, yeah. but just, um, you know, you talked about your kind of like life philosophy and how hard it was to join like a, a corporate, corporate yeah. band, but what was it like going from relative like indie kind of Beyond indie, tiny, tiny, tiny Montreal, like tiny clubs. Like, I mean, other than that one Smashing Pumpkin show, I did not play to more than... 45 to 90 people other than that one show and then my first show with whole um august 2000 uh was the reading festival in front of 65,000 people that was my eighth concert of my life <laughs> uh it was easier than playing a small club and i've always said that to people <laughs> there's no faces you don't even you no one can even see if I'm playing <laughs> or singing, I, it was just like singing to like a huge ocean. I, it was a very uh, easy transition actually. And, and in fact, when I made my solo records and I went to smaller size venues after like just got bigger and bigger with Hole and then the Pumpkins was just arena tours. All I ever did, we did one special kind of like in stores or club, but it was arena size stuff pretty much. and. When I made my solo records and started playing small places, I mean, that is more intimidating and it's much harder. I mean, A, they can hear and see everything you are doing. Um, that stuff was kind of easy. And I, I have a good memory for music, so I, it's like I didn't make mistakes, so I don't, didn't feel like I'm like fucking up in front of lots of people. I, it, was, it was an easy transition. I actually think that, I mean, it was like messed up and then I went from A to Z in like one day. So I never understood the arc of evolution as a performer, as a musician, as like a band member, as a you know, career trajectory. I just like bleh, went all the way to like, you've made it. And that's like a weird thing. So I've, oh, I've always been trying to like rewind time and get back to like everything that I missed in between. And that's what my solo records were. We're like, starting from there, something from small, having to put it together, having to like see it through, struggle with it a little bit. Like that was like great because uh, I kind of just went backwards. Um, and what was your role in whole, like once you were a band member, <clears throat> uh, how much involvement did you have in the songwriting or recording process? Yeah, I mean, we were in every, every there every step of the way, every day, every session, everything. I mean, you know, but, I don't, luckily I don't care about money and royalties and things, but you know, there is some bands that recognize the drummers and bass players uh, nurture and create songs. And then there are others that break it down to quite literally the clinical thing that a bunch of people in the 1920s <laughs> created, which is chords, lyrics. <laughs> and um, it, it was not really a nurturing fair way to handle me and Patty's level of commitment because we were there every day doing everything that they were doing and Courtney has a really particular way of like writing. I mean Eric came with more like specific here's a riff but Courtney's way of writing a song basically stems from six hours of a jam on one riff one lyrical thing and then you carve it together and that the amount of time there was not like we arrive and there's songs we are there <laughs> making these songs all together you know and so patty and i i i mean i never even like asked for writing credit i got i got some they designated some when they deemed that i had given vocal melodies riffs <laughs> i did a lot of stuff and we got slivers um but and really i don't hold grudges and i really don't like making money with music. I've been so lucky that I even got a dollar ever from music. I don't, that's the corporation part. I don't want to spoil my love with a financial equation. And I have been fighting to protect that my whole life. I, my parents were never very well off. They just did what they believed. They were freelancers with no security. As long as they could eat and like have a cool apartment, that's how I was raised and that's what I wanted. And so I never even like fought for, I mean, I had lawyers who were like, are you insane? Why are you taking less than you deserve? I'm like, cause I don't want to talk about money with the people I'm in a band with. Cause I don't care enough about it. And I'd rather keep shit kind of cool 
because, you know, Eric and Courtney, who are the founders of the band, and they should absolutely have like full right of ownership of all that. They were more business people and had to, you know, and they'd experienced whatever happened with Kurt and all. I just let them figure that out. Um, I can't say that anybody in the band was good with business. And I do feel very bad because in the end, I don't think it worked out well because uh, it was also terrible, you know, crazy. It was like the last dying breath of like the corporate millions and millions destroying alternative culture. So it was just like the last moment of corporatizing every drop of alternative culture. So I also was watching that in total horror and disgust of like, okay, great. We're going to spend a million dollars on a music video. You guys have all lost your minds. And these guys are going to try to make Courtney into like a top 40 thing. Wow, this is crazy. So I just really disconnected myself from so much of that. But I was at every single, um, you know, writing session uh, took us years to write Celebrity Skin. And the main, you know, thing I brought to it, other than being, I consider myself a very good bass player who collaborates really well and works really well with drummers and song arrangements and buildups. And so I'm very proud of my bass playing, but it was definitely my, my singing that brought the most to whole is that that was the most intensive um, on the recordings. Uh, we're working with that big, super snazzy Michael Beinhorn producer, is that I worked harder on my backup vocals than anything. And because of my choir days and my wonderful Welsh choir teacher, I had an ear for um, harmonies. And on Celebrity Skin, there is, um, to every Courtney track, there is me doubling her once to three times. And then there is two to four to five part harmonies of me behind every chorus on Celebrity Skin. So. I have more of my voice on that record than I do on even my own solo records in some ways. Um, so it was very lush one, you know, they wanted a lush sound and I was the, you know, angel to the wild screamer. So we just like coded everything with my voice. Um, and I had a great time working on that record. I really was, I mean, again, I just stayed with the music. I just played the music, made the songs as good as I could and stayed out of all the weird ass business that was just nothing but horrifying to me. I just like didn't even want to know what the managers thought, didn't want to really know what Courtney's hopes for, you know, goals and the difficulties between Eric and Courtney and, you know, Patty, we lost her during that time. It was just brutal business. And I did not, I tried to stay as far away from the business decisions as I could. And I just was really present for the music, you know. Because you left soon after. Mm hmm. So yeah. Was your, like, what was the kind of de the demise of Hole, or, or what was the um, that led you to leave? Well, actually, I don't even know that I've ever mentioned this to Courtney or Eric, but now it's been 20 years, I could say anything. Uh, but it's not, it's not that it's a secret, but it actually is. Um, Due to the nature of that band being so business, uh, so for example, when I joined the band, for the first few weeks I was just like paid 600 bucks a week and I was a bass player. And then all of a sudden they went from this like the old Kurt management to like this massive, insane Def Leppard Metallica manager came in, Q Prime, they're pretty legendary. And as soon as they swooped in, there was something about we gotta lock this bass player in. So all of a sudden I had this like insane contract in front of me and I've asked my friends on like touch and go, like all my indie rock friends, I'm like, do you have a lawyer I could talk to? And I got this really sweet lawyer, redhead Richard Grable, legend, and it's just helped all the, I don't even know that I ever paid him once. I have no idea, but he was so nice. And he was like, oh no, you can't sign this. This is insane. They are making you, a commit to five years with no particular, you're not allowed to make music outside of this band. And they are asking you to commit to five years with a quarter of any money that Hole makes, but no guarantees of what that will be. And no, what did I do? I, I, I spoke my mind to the asshole manager who heard I got a lawyer who said, and I'm friends with this guy, friends with this guy now, Peter Mensch, I've made a man, you know, I, but I was always like, you guys are all non-intuitive people. You're about to like ruin my overall feeling of this band trying to get me to do this. But 
when the manager heard I got a lawyer, he said, you got a lawyer and tried to bully me. And he said, can I ask you, what is it? What's the problem with like pointing at this paper? I'm like, well, I want to know what it says in here. And I want to know that my plans for my life might work out uh, in tandem with this. And he said to me, and I don't think I've ever told him <laughs> this either, but I mean, I wouldn't be too shy to, but he said, what are you going to do? Go back and be a Montreal and be you? <laughs> it's like, yeah, I don't know. I guess we just met, but I certainly could. Um, and it was like this really like amazingly insulting, like this is kind of like Billy Corgan saying, this is like the greatest offer ever. And you just like be in a band and not work. And I was, so I think we changed a couple of things. All I really cared about is that I would be able to play music outside of Hole. But I also didn't want to rock the boat. I don't even know. I, you know, I definitely didn't listen to the lawyer and I signed the contract. And it was a five year contract and all this crazy stuff happened. You know, we did live through this forever. And then Celebrity Skin took forever to write and record. And then by the time Patty was gone and we were like, 98 release, you know, like the end of the year, we we're like, you know, release Celebrity Skin. It was a big, um, you know, already quickly kind of more mainstream success as far as like radio play, et cetera. And there was like kind of hope in that like, well, it's a weird polished corporate record, but there's been no other female voices on radio other than Gwen Stefani and Alanis Morissette. And this is a big deal that Courtney's voice is the only other woman on mainstream rock radio. And that was kind of enough to be like, well, maybe there was a point to this like insane, overly produced record. That's a pretty big deal. This unbelievably wild woman who went from like teenage whore to this, but the problem is, is simultaneously her red carpet movie career was happening and there was a lot of delays in making celebrity skin because of her amazing roles and how remarkable the teenage horror went to be those two incredible roles and milos Forman believed in her and she was like taking hollywood by storm she was more sane and together than she had ever been as far as a really she was at the top of her game and very reasonable ish to deal with she had a very nice boyfriend Frances was almost, no, Frances was still pretty young. So I, you know, she's a single mother trying to, and she was in a pretty good headspace. Um, so we were getting along well and our shows were amazing. The shows were the best we've ever played. She was playing the best. I was at like way better musician after making that record. So I loved the music. At that moment, I really did feel very strongly about the power of us. We played uh, an amazing show at Glastonbury and we were like later on the bill. We did a couple of headlining festivals in Australia and Canada where we were the only women, as always, we're always like the only women on the bill and we're the headliners. And it was a huge deal and I was so proud of it. And I was so satisfied, even though it had been tumultuous and difficult, she and I were getting along better than we ever had because she was really like quite sober and together and um all of a sudden all this like other movie stuff started getting very like obvious that like her agents and the managers were getting kind of more excited about her movie career and I just started having a sense I'm like uh-oh she's gonna like not support this record because she's gonna to wanna to make another movie, which is what all these delays have been. And like, as I said, I don't want to be in a band that doesn't work. I was like sitting around in LA, not my favorite city, did not wanna live in LA. And I was like, this is not the life I want. I'm so happy and proud of it, but this is like not gonna work if she starts being more movie star than she is musician after all this after all this commitment to this record and next thing i know um we did we were offered this headlining tour this canadian festival and the joke about me being a canadian is i only ever played clubs in montreal and it wasn't until i joined hole and five years later that i did my first cross canada canadian tour i had never been across canada and actually i'd been going around this is a side note but it shows what a montrealer i am and what a daughter of my parents i am but i had always been around the world like i am a canadian 
and then I went across Canada. I'm like, oh, sorry, I'm a Montrealer. <laughs> Canada is very different <laughs> than Quebec. I actually did not know. So I had this like really, we were the best we have ever played. We went from the East Coast all the way to Maritimes, had a great show in Montreal, went all the way to Vancouver. And somewhere in the middle of that tour, so it was the summer of 299, I was like, it's not going to get better than this, actually. This is like the best we've ever been. This is Canada, huge festivals, like unbelievable. Like I feel so strong as a musician. And in on that tour, it dawned on me that the five years had just come up and that nobody had addressed my contract or asked me to continue. And I just had this fucking flash. I'm like, that's it. I got to get out because <laughs> this is, and she was like, we had been offered all these huge tours. It was the summer and we were supposed to do these fall tours, Europe tour. She was not committing to anything. She was going to like wait to do, I don't even remember what her movie schedule was, but I just, I was like, fuck, no way. She is going to make us sit around and not do anything. And that's just rude, <laughs> but also not cool for this record. And we played our last show in Vancouver uh, and it was an amazing show. It was actually Courtney's birthday. July 9th, I believe it was her birthday. Oh, her birthday was in Calgary a few nights earlier. So we had this great party for her. I like hired this like ridiculous entertainment. We had this like amazing, great summer tour. I got, you know, the end of the tour came. I like went to sleep that night in Vancouver and I woke up. I was like, that's it. It is, I'm done. And I, I did my part. I committed and I fulfilled my commitment and I have to move on. Uh, because I can't sit around and it's not fair to music. It's not fair to other aspirations that I might have. And I'm just going to get mad and unhappy. And so I flew home to LA again, not to the place I wanted to live. So I was waiting to get the hell out of there as fast as possible. Um, and I wrote a letter to Eric and Courtney. I don't know where it is because it was a handwritten thing that I faxed, I believe. And I told them and we didn't have cell phones or emails. So I don't really remember what the immediate reaction was. I do remember getting a very intense five page fax back shortly after from her politely asking me not to go and warning me <laughs> that if I went, <laughs> um, actually, no, this is what happened in that same exact week. This is what happened. This is so fucking crazy. My phone and my fax machine in my little LA house were there and I'd sent the, the fax and a few days later, my phone rang and B Billy Corgan called and said, well, the stars have lined up, Melissa. Are you ready to leave whole? Because Darcy just left. And I don't know how, back to the fairy tale part, how did that happen? The Darcy left the exact same time that I knew I was done. And, um, and I said, <laughs> Billy, like I did the, I'm like, no, I actually don't think I can join your band. I am just got out of this thing. It's so heavy. I need time alone. And he said, just get on the plane, come to Chicago, listen to our new record and tell me to my face that you don't want to join my band. And I flew to Chicago. He was a, you know, I hadn't seen him much over my years with Hole because him and Courtney would go back and forth from being enemies to friends. And it was just, I think ultimately I was probably a pawn in their relationship quite often. Again, I, don't, I didn't, didn't bother myself with that. I just stuck with the music, but there was some, lots of drama between them all the time. And um, I arrived in Chicago. It was their final record. He was like, it's simple. It's our farewell tour. I just have to, we're just putting out this. It was a beautiful record, Machine of Machines of God. Not a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people heard it, but not a lot of, I feel like not a lot of Pumpkins fans like give it the credit it deserves. It was really one of my favorite records of theirs since the early records, which meant the world to me. And so the music was so good. And um, I've always gotten along well with Jimmy and James. And uh, it was a really simple offer, which was we're just doing one world tour. It's one year. Just come on, have fun. And we'll pay you well. And it was shocking. I was like, well, 
oh, I have to do this. It's just a, mainly for the music. I just, the lesson in music, that's, it was so worth it. And I'm so glad I did it as far as as a musician. Um, it was very intense. I mean, there was more music than I've ever played in my life. And it was like very demanding. Um, like at the first week of rehearsals, um, it was also a very simple contract. Sharon Osborne was their manager, and the meeting for that contract was Ozzy Osborne pouring me tea and then being like, "No, just sign this. It's fine." And the and the, the weekly thing was so high that I was like, "Okay, you're gonna pay me that? Okay." I mean, that means if I work for one year straight. I'm gonna make more money than my five years in whole. Are you fucking kidding me? Okay, I'm actually gonna make money because I didn't make money in whole. And I'm actually going to learn music in a way that I have never learned music before. And I happily signed it with Crumpets and Ozzy Osbourne and had a really cool year long vacation. Intense in terms of uh, demanding, um, uh, the first week of rehearsals, Billy told me the, the rules, which were you don't get sick, you can't make a mistake, and there's no days off. I said, okay, I can do that, and I did. And I only ever made one mistake once, and it was at an in-store at HMV in New York City, and he pointed it out, and I bonked him on the head. I'm like, are you a real asshole? I never make mistakes. You do not have to point to me when I made one note mistake. So that was like, it, it was worth it though. Um, it was insane. You know, Billy is very particular. So we didn't often have opening bands. We opened for ourselves. So it was five hour shows, acoustic, an hour and a half acoustic set opening for a three hour, like five uh, encore and every set list was different, never repeated. So imagine three to five hours of music, completely different set list, different key changes, different versions of the songs we already knew. I had five basses tuned in all these crazy ways and new B-sides, you know, they had that insane box set. I mean, they have a lot of music. This is not just the albums. This is, so B-sides, I traveled with a suitcase of binder notes, music, I could not, I, I lived, I actually, one thing that messed me up as a musician is there was too much information, so I could never rely on my memory anymore. I had to look at notes. It fucked me up, actually, because I had never looked at notes with the whole, the whole was like quite simple music, but this stuff was so elaborate and so changing that I had this crazy, and I should probably, like pumpkin fans at some point, make a zine out of this crazy notes because I also don't read music I read like a c d times two part four and I have these like big sharpie glow-in-the-dark plastic sheets that were in this huge binder that my guitar tech had to pick up like whole like I played my set going like this and then you whoosh, pick it up go down it was like an insane um cheat sheet system like I could not play a show without cheat sheets. It was actually very stressful because like if I had forgotten that binder, if I had lost it, I would not be able to play a show. So it was very stressful as far as, um, but it was so good musically. And, um, and then, you know, that was a one year contract. It was a world tour with a finished date and it was this really clear, cool thing. And back to Courtney and her facts is, cause it all happened in the same week she understandably thought that that meant I was leaving to join the pumpkins, which I wasn't. I really had already decided I had sent my note. She had like thought that I must have talked to Billy on tour. I didn't, I didn't even have like, we didn't have texting. I didn't, had no idea Darcy was leaving. It just was magically and perfect that it happened at the same time. So I did get an epic a letter from Courtney at the time which has just long disappeared or faded, I don't, but all the only lines I remember is her warning me about, because my letter was, I have to go make my own music. I want to explore music. I want to, and she said something about like warning me of being like a Nicole Kidman ice queen making music or something. And then uh, warning me of becoming Billy Corgan's purse. So those were her two like, are you sure you want to do this? These are the things that you will become. Um, I don't, 
that's luckily I remember that because I don't have the letter anymore but I she actually was pretty cool about it I mean that was like and I said no I really want to move on and I have to and I need to play music I need to play music I want she understood that and at one point she even actually tried to keep me they then figured out the contract thing and there was an interesting moment where she tried to um, get me to sign another contract where she would give me money to stay committed while doing other things and maybe even pay for my solo records. There was a strange, and that kind of all felt, I was so out that I don't even really like, we barely, I mean, it was an interesting, I mean, she was making offers trying to get me to, and it, I'm grateful for that, but, um, but I just like, yeah, I guess I, I don't consider myself a big like, it's done, it's done, but I, it was and I knew that I just had to stick to it and there was just so that's happened and then the pumpkins happened which was pretty much not more than what I told you other than like in you know more shows than I ever played in one year in my life and um it was great and um and then I moved on there were like a couple of years before you started your, yeah, your, your I quit party. music when I when I left oh, Hole in the Pumpkins. I, I was just like, this is crazy. I just, <laughs> my relationship to music is so not down to earth. I need to take a break. And I went back to photography and I um, started going through all my archives, which I still am going through, um, of all my photography. So I took a picture, uh, pretty much a roll a day during all my years in Hole and the Pumpkins. I got really elaborate by the time I was in the Pumpkins with like foot switches and multiple cameras. And I just, so I have 30,000 uh, photographic negatives of my six years, that, those years I was in there. Um, and I uh, decided I should look through it and see what a, what revelations and sort of make a photo book return to the language of uh, images but also return to my voice and myself and take a break um, and I had a photo show opening it was September 10th 2001 in Brooklyn I had friends come from Montreal LA sweet Eric Erlinson came uh, James Eha came it was a really big moment for me. I had a solo photo show at the Sweet Gallery in Brooklyn. I was like, I'm gonna be a photographer. I'm going to go into the world. Maybe I'll go to do my master's now. And I was returning to that. And then after the uh, show, we all went karaokeing in the East Village. It was a really fun night, all these friends. And I was like, I'm done with music. I'm gonna do this. And then 9-11 happened the next morning. And it was this very strange uh, turning point. I was living in the Chelsea Hotel. I watched, uh, the burning towers from the roof and I don't know I don't know what happened but while I was living that year at the Chelsea Hotel it occurred to me that I am the luckiest person I know that was given this like one in a life once in a lifetime one in a million music career and to not continue making music would be really disrespectful to my opportunity and to music itself. And I started um, doubting this notion of like, I'm just gonna leave that. It's like, how could I leave something that I am so devoted to, but also that I've been so lucky in. And it's not like I'm gonna go back to, I mean, I might go back now, but I'll be like making like avant-garde jazz records in this room or something. I don't like jazz. I'm waiting for my jazz. I'm waiting for my jazz like discovery. But I was like that at the time, like the, the time is now. Like, why would I stop now? And this might be like the last time in my life that I kind of like have the energy to make like rock music the center of my life. So I started going through some of my old demos. I had a ton of, I always worked on a four track. Even when I was in Hole, there was a bunch of my songs that we used to, Billy Corgan wanted to consider actually when he came into Celebrity Skin. He took two of my songs that ended up on my solo record to Courtney and said, I think we should put, and we actually did for Celebrity Skin, record one of them top to bottom and the vocals were never done because it was never clear whether me or Courtney would sing it. And there's a whole track, it's called Good News. Um, but Billy was very supportive of me during the writing process in Celebrity Skin. And uh, uh, so I had all these demos, cause I was just, you know, I kind of 
wrote songs once in a while, but they also they always had a lot of like drum machines and like backwardsy sampley things, lots of textures, not like singer guitar. I mean, I did play, I wrote on a guitar and a bass, but uh, uh, and when Patty and I lived together, we had this cool music room where my four track was set up and she and I used to make music too together. So um, just like weird side project art stuff. Uh, so I started making my first solo record and the two solo records um, were both self-financed and then sold later to a label. So in both cases, I used my pumpkins money to make my first solo record and I made a uh, I did quite well with my my first solo record as far as, um, I mean, always Europe and Canada, and that's, to me, all that, <laughs> no offense, USA, but, you know, touring USA is not really as pleasurable, and it's also just a very different audience, and the one major tour I did in the USA was uh, the greatest forgotten tour in the history of alternative music in the USA, called the Cur Curiosa Tour. Robert Smith from The Cure hand-selected eight bands to go across Canada, uh, go across the US and Toronto and a couple like, just like the Lollapalooza, but it was 2004 and alternative music was officially not happening. Like there was, I don't know what happened with digital era, the, you know, the corporate blowout of stupid, uh, all those big signings in the nineties. I mean, obviously there was like the white stripes and strokes, but that was kind of very vintage nostalgia, but like just alternative like music was not in the airwaves and in the, um, so this tour, which I was the only woman on, this was 2004, Robert Smith picked Interpol, Muse, Mogwai, my solo record, uh, so me, <laughs> Oftermower, <laughs> this lady, uh, and um, a cool unknown uh, UK band called Cooper Temple Claws, and that was it, and it was a, remarkable eight week tour across the US and not one music journalist other than the NME came to document that tour. Roberts and The Cure were headlining and The Cure, I mean, there was no press. The venues were half empty. Nobody knew it was happening because it was like before the internet. I don't, it was like the internet had happened but alternative people were still alternative so they weren't on it and nobody, not Spin, not Rolling Stone, nobody covered it. And like Robert Smith lost so much money doing it and he just wanted to bring like the Lollapalooza era of rock music and music to the US. And the people though in the audience, like the half filled sheds and the half were the happiest. Like I was like, the alternative people are still alive. They're here, but they're all like, we barely knew it was happening. We're here. It was the greatest tour of my whole career. It was the most friendly and to be around a Robert Smith that is not a power driven diva was mind blowing for me to see what a leader can be in one of the most important rock bands in like alternative music history and be the most modest, wonderful, sharing, generous person. That I had never seen before. I had never experienced that level of like modesty and sweetness and the whole tour. Interpol are still buddies of mine. The whole, everybody, Muse, Everybody got along. There was not one ego in the entire tour. Mogwai, oh, The Rapture was the other band. It was the most egoless tour, which is hence, I guess, maybe why like alternative music were full of a bunch of weird shy people who weren't like trying to be super successful or something. I don't know. We were just all very nice. And that was like one of the highlights of my uh, first record. Um, and it really like, it's when I started becoming comfortable as a front person and as a, I know it's hard to do as a bass player for many reasons, but um, that was exciting and great. And then um, my second record, um, because I signed my first record to Capitol Records, the second record had quite a great budget related to it, and I always made my records very affordable with friends and never spent a ton of money. So I got to make what I'm most proud of was my second record, which is Out of Our Minds, um, which is also when I fell in love with Tony Stone, who is my husband and co-founder of Basilica Hudson, which is the last eight years of my life, I've been devoted to um, a reclaimed 1880s factory that gives a voice to independent and innovative voices in all, all forms, whether it's a farmer, an uh, environmental ad 
advocate or a musician or a writer and uh, filmmakers we focus on music and film a lot but so it was during the making of my second record that I fell in love with Tony Stone I had also moved back to Montreal because I was really done with this country um, it was after the Iraq war so 9-11 had already kind of <laughs> made things pretty sad and then the Iraq war was like the Montrealer in me just could not um, accept the political landscape of this. It was during the Bush era. Um, and I moved back to Montreal, but then I fell in love with a New Yorker and love is more important than politics. So I wanted to be with him and we moved here to Hudson, New York because it was a geographical in-between of New York City and Montreal. Um, and I put that second record out with a really interesting all women run um, company in Montreal called the Phi Center, run by a very eccentric, interesting philanthropist woman named Phoebe Greenberg. And I actually met her at Sundance because Tony and I made a film that accompanied the albums called Out of Our Minds. So it's a, it was a, Capitol Records looked at me and said, are you making a record? Or I was like, no, I'm making a concept record. There's a film, there's a comic book, there's gonna be all these like, I think we're gonna bring it to movie theaters, art galleries, and they're like, that sounds complicated. I was like, no, no, this, it was like, that was the time where I was ahead of my time. Next thing you know, two years later, every musician needs to make a movie, needs to make a book or whatever. Like, it, whatever it was, they didn't understand. They were staring at me. I'm like, no, it's a whole package. And we have to like multimedia, multimedia. And I don't even like the internet, but it was like literally multimedia that could be distributed in all these ways. And this really interesting group in Montreal met me at the, we premiered the film at Sundance and I met them at the, uh, the Canadian consulate party. And one, like a journalist was like, oh, Melissa, you have to meet Phoebe and her, her team. Uh, and she was this very intense redhead woman. Melissa, this is Phoebe. And she's like, I've heard of you. And, uh, and I said, what does your company do? She's like, we only do fucked up shit. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, I have this, this concept album that's about a woman who travels through time, who follows the uh, blood uh, into like from a Viking's heart into bleeding trees, and then she comes out at the other side of a car crash. And she's like, perfect, <laughs> I'm gonna come see the movie. And then they ended up signing a weird joint venture with me, so I owned my second record, and then I distributed it in Europe, which was my biggest market, with Roadrunner Records, which is like a big metal label that like basically no women are on, and it was really um, a good, uh, uh, scene for me in Europe so I did an amazing best ever European tour we got to go to Ukraine and oh god just like the best like a, a very very I had an amazing second album as far as my creative expression my musical abilities and an amazing European um, which is really all I care about. Like I got to go to Istanbul. I just I got to do the international. What's what I like is international places where you connect with people who don't speak the same language with the, as you and through music. And um, that tour ended and we came, we had already come to Hudson, New York uh, and we had a house here and um, uh, I was 39 years old and the man I loved really wanted to be able to have a baby with me and I had not really thought about kids otherwise. Um, I mean, I like life, <laughs> I love love, and I, but it wasn't, I'm not someone I felt like I had to have a child and I had always avoided long-term relationships for as long as humanly possible because I knew they would hold me back <laughs> from the things that I love, <laughs> which is music and it's hard to be in music and to tour the world with, you know, so I was always very smart about that. I'm like, I'm not even gonna try <laughs> because it just won't work and I like my independence. And so I was 39 and I was continuing to be very, very fortunate in my um, adventures in music. And I uh, got pregnant on the first time ever having unprotected sex in my entire life because I've always been incredibly safe and never ever had semen enter my uterus until the day I conceived my daughter, River Eve, after Mauer Stone. So I got pregnant very quickly and we at the same time met this crazy guy who owned this big factory who asked me and Tony to take it over for him because he had seen it as like this possibility 
for the center community space. He was very, very wild, kind of like pre-Burning Man guy in his 60s, very eccentric, and um, was part of the first wave of New York City expats who were moving upstate New York. So in the 90s and early 2000s, like a bunch of, you know, New York is ridiculous, it's too expensive. It's, you know, so people were already starting to move up here and we were part of the second wave of artists and people looking to like not live in New York City, have space. And um, so he had been here already for 10 years when he offered us in 2010 to take over the building. So he still holds the mortgage and he believed in me and Tony's like music and film program ideas that we proposed when we met him and we saw the space. I used to jam in this room for my second solo record. I, I rehearsed in this room. And then he just made us an offer we couldn't refuse. He's like, you guys gotta take this building on and do it. And Tony was a filmmaker and not really like, neither of us were looking for brick and mortar, but being a musician and a filmmaker, to have brick and mortar as part of your, was a very unexpected and exciting turn of events. More work than I've ever, oh, music was so easy compared to what I do now. So that part has been a little difficult, but it's to be able to offer a platform and a place for people is worth sacrificing music for a while. Um, so I have for, and, and it was good as it came in tandem with being pregnant and I knew I would not be a touring mother. I wanted to be home and I needed to do something at home and bring the thing that I love in the world to me while I was home. And so we were very lucky that it all worked out at the right time. And um, the last show I played for my second solo record, which is pretty much the last show I played, full show, uh, was uh, in July, in August of 2011. My daughter was born in October 2011. Um, it was actually in August, it was the last of this, uh, it was a metal festival in Toronto called Heavy T.O. I was on, so I was eight months pregnant, seven months pregnant, and I was on a bill, only woman on the bill, with Mastodon, Slayer, Rob Zombie, Judas Priest, and I was like, this is the perfect way to go. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. My daughter and I are the only women on this stage, and I love witchy poo men who make heavy metal music because those guys there is witchies any other you know they don't know but they're tapping into their woman i mean some of them do know and like i do believe that why i love um mystical heavy rock music is because we're all tapping into the deep woman inside and the kind of tension between males who don't have another outlet for that a lot of the time when they find, and I think that that's the power of something like Black Sabbath and the power of those bands, and even Billy Corgan and the Smashing Pumpkins, is that's in their male body where they feel like they're supposed to be these male warriors or something in life, but they are tapping into like the depth of, you know, cause it's not about a gender thing. It's about like the landscapes that you go on the, we all have access to everything. We all have access to the past, the future, sci-fi, mystical, witchy, you know, like whatever. And there's something about the dynamic between heavy music and the, the mystical trip of looking for the other and looking for the other side and looking past this mortal she shell that we live in. And this, like the real world is not, beautiful it is fantastic in its humanity and in its mother nature and it's but the brutality of humans coexisting is pretty profound as we know um and the transcendence that happens in all music but specifically for me it works the best when you go into the the realm of the witches and goblins and the time travel and the past this body thing um and so for my daughter and I to have played that show and I drove home because I was, you know, too pregnant to fly. We like came and we were driving back from Toronto to Hudson. I'm like it's a really perfect ending note for my music career. Uh, and I happily dove into motherhood. I did not, uh, I didn't have any, I did a real, real intensive motherhood, no babysitters. My mother's not here. Tony's parents are not around much either. So I just was a full-time mother. I had never been home for a year straight and I breastfed for multiple years and I just 
gave my daughter nothing but a simple, warm, tiny little town. And I walked the streets of this town more than, I mean, I had never lived anywhere for more than six months in my life. So by the time I was 40 and with my daughter here in Hudson, I had never owned a house. I had never even really known how to cook or clean. No domestic ability. I'm still learning. It's really hard to always basically live like a teenager in a rock band uh, and then become a mother. So it's been hard learning curve, um, but I'm eight years in. She just turned seven. Uh, and so my process really started, you know, once I got pregnant, I was like, that's it. I'm changing my life. I'm going to understand the other side of this. And that's what brought me to here. I feel like that, does that, what was the question? Yeah. No, <laughs> I mean, you started with something that somehow I, yeah, I don't know. You just answered like the whole. Like, okay. But there were, you did, <laughs> there was the question at the top where you asked something about Courtney or no. Yeah, just like the demise. Oh, of the Courtney. demise and yeah. then the how I made, oh, my solo records. Yeah. yeah and my two records. solo records, I'm so, oh, so, so happy with them. I had such a beautiful, they were all collaborative, you know, lots of co-songwriters. Like I got to live out all my fantasies to play with all my favorite drummers, all my favorite guitar players. I, my solo records were nothing but heaven on earth for me. And I'm, again, was very lucky that I had a little money in the bank from that one job. And then I had a label help in the next one. I got to make two really personal, personal records. And um, I, my Your love. daughter's really gonna love that conception story too. It's probably the best. <laughs> Oh yeah, actually, well, actually, because I don't think I've never, I've never told her because we haven't actually gone to sex ed yet. <laughs> I've never told her. What she does know, though, is that we had a home birth uh, in our house, my only house, and and it wasn't necessarily because I am the ultimate um, natural woman hippie. It was I hate hospitals and I hate needles so much that when I heard that when you go into a hospital, they give you an IV, I was like, oh, well, no, I cannot have a child at a hospital then. I don't even, didn't even ever think what the other side of, if you're not at a hospital, you're in your house. <laughs> I, but I found a really amazing midwife. They talk about power women. Oh my God. Like I thought I had met amazing, powerful women. The women who devote themselves to women giving birth, the doula, Mary Riley, the doula, redhead, and, um, uh, Jenna Houston, the warrior, they have been delivering babies. They delivered each other's babies that are my age in the 70s. These two women have been working together in the Hudson Valley since like 1970. And they are the best. They were the most incredible powerhouse team of women. I was like, whoa, I am humbled. I did not realize how not womanly I was. These strong, their entire lives is devoted to making sure that women feel safe and taken care of and empowered in having a baby. And this hospital system in this country is not, uh, it has terrible practices. Um, it's obviously good for emergencies and all that. So of course, home birth, yes, emergencies. A hospital was five minutes away if I needed it. So uh, my daughter's birth story that she knows is it was a one hour birth and it was the fastest. I literally was like, that's it? I've been uh, dreading the most difficult. It was so peaceful and so beautiful. And she, my husband got to catch her and she uh, reached her hand out of my vagina to hold my husband's hand coming out of the womb. And it's on film. And the midwife is saying, I have never, ever, ever seen. <laughs> she put her hand out and grabbed his hand out of my, it was incredible. It was like the greatest birth story. I, Again, I'm very fortunate. I love my daughter. I, I, we, we had a very good beginning together and I gave her as quiet of a beautiful, quiet house as I could for as long as possible because the world is very noisy and it's gonna get very loud and she's just coming into uh, you know, the first grade and the cocoon and yeah. She redhead? Yes. Great. Fucking okay. can't believe it. <laughs> Cannot believe it because my husband has black hair. Yeah. But my mother-in-law is a complete Auburn redhead exactly as me and my daughter. So well chosen. <laughs> um, I just have a few questions mm -hmm. at the end that I ask everybody. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about your role in and contribution to rock history? I don't know. 
I don't know how I feel about it. I'm still thinking about it. Uh, having just done the tribute for Courtney at Basilica last month, I am beginning to see it a little bit clearer now that I've really looked at her. So I took the opportunity, what I do at Basilica a lot is curate and frame events. And a lot of it is about reframing the way you see music, the way you see writers, the way you see films. So we work uh, on all of our programs to really sort of like left of center, connect the dots in different ways to change the experience for audience members who are coming to engage in arts. And uh, so doing the Courtney event, which was a kind of, um, I was like the MC of a This Is Your Life mashed up with a variety show where I had different artists come do tributes to her. I had different people write things, lots of um, filmed dedications from people from all over. Uh, and then I sat down with a conversation with her with very clear questions I had about how the fuck did she know about global warming when she dedicated in 1998 celebrity skin to all the stolen water of Los Angeles and why in 2000 and two when she on the red carpet was asked what advice she had for aspiring actresses which was to not go to a private party at Harvey, Harvey Weinstein's hotel room why nobody listened to her in either counts you know I mean we celebrity skin was us in front of burning palm trees basically mourning the death of, of California um, and you know, this is what witches know. She's tapped in, she's taken it from the ether. She's, you know, she, so we got to sit down and have a conversation about very, very specific worldly topics about the, I went through my, a bunch of my photographic archives with her. So we like laughed about the past. And then we ended the show. Um, luckily we had done a run through the night before when Courtney got in. Um, because I cried through the run through, so I didn't cry during the, the live performance, but everybody in the audience did. We, I had been approached earlier this year by um, uh, the Woodstock Rock Academy, and they are a nonprofit who do rock school things with kids over in Woodstock and with teenagers. And, um, and they approached me and said that the, the women of the Woodstock Rock Academy had taken, started a new division called Rebel Girls, and they were doing a show in Woodstock, <clears throat> and they had heard that I lived in the area, and would I um, consider joining the girls for a few songs? And I have not played whole songs in 20 years. I always like doing things like that. I have done like rock camps and talking to, students and stuff so it was very sweet and you know some of our we had mutual some of my friends were some of the parents like but very just I didn't know them well but I went and the moment they asked me because I had decided that Courtney was going to be the pioneering people person we did for our big uh, biannual fundraiser I thought hmm if these girls are good maybe maybe they'd fit into the Courtney night and I went and uh, played Doll Parts of Miss World with an amazing group of girls, 15 and 16 year old girls. They were so good. And then when we were putting the, the event together, I'm like, that's the finale. Courtney and I have got to play with these, these girls. And when I first told Courtney, like, so here's the show. I'm like, first of all, she's gonna be so overwhelmed because it's like this insane variety show, a two hour show. The half she's just like watching, like we're presenting to her. And then the other half she joins. And what kind of songs do you want to play? Courtney, you want to play a couple of songs together. This is great girl band that can be our backup band and she was like wait a second 15 year old 16 years are you sure i was like yeah they're great she's like are you sure they can play i'm like yeah and come the night before and it was so powerful and we ended it playing miss world and doll parts with these 15 and 16 year old girls their parents were like i mean the girls we i don't know who is more moved me and Courtney or the girls. It was such a equal exchange of fragility. Courtney and I are so like out of shape as far as, you know, we haven't played those songs. She maybe does them occasionally at these weird one-offs, but we haven't played them with full band. Um, and 
she's in a really really interesting great healthy clear mental space right now and it was very vulnerable for her to do it and very vulnerable for me to do it and very meaningful for us to do it together so we were very vulnerable together and then these girls were nervous shy didn't didn't want to make a mistake and we we're like no 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 we're the ones that are gonna be making mistakes not you don't worry and it was that somewhere in there i know what the legacy is i think that courtney and i and everyone in our generation <clears throat> are only going to start making the impact now i don't I, I know that there was people that we whose lives we changed that were growing with us but i think that that was a very niche alternative culture and i feel like courtney's you know radically strange celebrity and the widow and the tragedy and the drugs and the chaos really overshadowed the impact of that band in those songs and therefore my role in it too I mean it's just like that is a side note to who Courtney is which is why I wanted to do that event last month it's, that's not fair that music those three albums and that person being so ahead of her time and so fearless and that's the only way that women could have been saying that at that time nobody was listening to any woman like that whole world of academic you know asking for it and all of the we were all blind to how unbelievably um not free we yet were and are continuing to try to you know liberate you know my my mother was only a first wave feminist and like she's still alive i mean just started this just started so we and we whoever people our age you know that i think it made a deep cultural impact with us but it's those 15 and 16 year old girls that we played with last month that i think now is when we might actually see what our legacy might be because i think now there is a new world of people that have been raised by in this corporate, you know, where is the real voices? Where is truth and individuality and not this mass consumed and created, not to mention completely illegal, corrupt, horrible systems that are destroying our planet and destroying the people who live on it. And I don't mean just with environmental disasters, but like the healthcare that we don't have, that just killing people killing people for their own corporate advantages and, and greed, etc. And that I think that it's the new youth that are going to discover real voices that we're saying really ballsy things that are still needing to be said now. So I think those girls are going to like maybe tap into where Hole fits in the thing. And as far as me beyond Hole, because obviously I'm not just my five years in Hole, I don't know. I think that I, I don't really, I think my, my time in rock music is that, and I'm happy that I've made a mark in rock music because it's given me so much and I love music to this, you know, it's just like the best. It's my favorite form of expression um, and my favorite way to share time with people. Um, so I'm happy I made an impact, but um, I definitely have a lot of other worlds that I want to make impacts in. Uh, starting with the four blocks that I live in and trying to make at least the place I live in in this very troubled country better. And we can make a difference if you work locally, and we are. And we're making a big difference with our art center and and our creative economy stimulus. We have a huge, I mean, there, it's really exciting to be able to actually focus on just the place that you live in and make it better. So that, I'll leave a little mark here too then. <laughs> yeah. Um. What are your thoughts on the visibility of women in rock history in general? Well, when I, I did, I was invited to Cleveland, Ohio last year to be part of a photo exhibit of musician photographers, and it was really cool. Really, it's my first time, you know, in a big museum show. Um, and because I was in town, I reached out to the bully, the guy from Q Prime who made me sign that contract and said, can you get me into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, please? He got me like VIP passes and I brought like all the photographers and my friends and from Hudson that came to visit me. And we got backstage tour of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame where they brought up only, because I guess that's what they thought I want to see, Patti Smith's shoes, like Kim Gordon's this, Kristen Pfaff's family donated uh, a bunch of her things. Um, so they brought me through like the archives, Joan Jett's like pins that were like, you know, women's choice. Like it was like all the most relevant like political issues 
I don't, you know, that would have been like late 70s or whatever, on her leather jacket were like pins that we should all be wearing right now. Um, so had an amazing tour of that, and it was all women, women historians, um, rock historians, uh, who gave us this like amazing full day there. And it was there that I learned that, do you know what percentage of women are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Do you know what percentage is? It's very is when, small. But like, guess. <laughs> I forget. Isn't it like... Yeah. So some people are like, it's got to be like 5%. No, it's it's like less than 1%. <laughs> so that is so, I mean, obviously there hasn't been as many women in rock music. That is true. I was often the only woman on stage and, you know, my solo thing or with Hole. I know that. So I'm not saying it's, you know, completely unjustified, but it's certainly not that small. And especially because the women who actually did do it should probably be over-recognized <laughs> for than all the men that were all, always doing it. So yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't, I, I mean, it's ridiculous, but every time people ask me that too, when I was like on tour with my uh, albums, it's like, it's the same in banking. It's the same in government. It's the same everywhere. So I, you know, what do I expect? I don't expect different, but I ex- expect that it's changing. And I do think it's changing. And I do think, um, I mean, look at the, recent primaries as far as the women elected officials and yeah yeah so it's cool it's evolving but it's taking you know it's taking a while as it would okay last question yeah what are you most proud of personally and or professionally oh i have no idea i really don't know other than well it's okay i mean like it's not like an album or a thing um i think (laughs) It all comes down to what I most admire in my parents, which is the spirit of following your own dreams and not compromising a thing and not doing it for the money, <laughs> most probably. I mean, it's just, it was how I was raised and it's what I've, it's kept, it's my barometer for everything I do. And um, I guess it's that, because it's that that drives me to do all the variety of things that I have done. <laughs>